God is good, God is trustworthy, God is generous. The psalmist said, it's on your notes if you're following along in Psalm 84, verse 11. The Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord gives favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. One translation says, the Lord gives grace and glory. God is generous. Romans 8, 32, and I just picked out a couple of verses, but there's a bunch more. It says, God did not keep back his own son, but he gave him for us. If God did this for us, won't he also freely give us everything else? What do you think? If God gave his only son for us, the verse says, won't he freely give us everything else that we need? Are you needy today? Now that's a, people go, no, I'm not needy. <laughs> How many here, anybody here thirsty? Anybody here thirsty this morning? My wife, this lady. I have one bottle of water. I'll tell you what, uh, Anna, I saw you raise your hand. And uh, here, come get my water. You're thirsty. Now, I do want to tell you one thing. It's uh, already been opened, and I drank half of it. So here. Now, here's the point. All of you, or most of you, are thinking, oh, she got a bottle that's already been drank from. It's already had the plastic cracked. So you're already thinking about what she didn't get, right? She didn't get a fresh bottle of water. She got my water. I've slobbered in it already. <laughs> but she was, and the lady down here would not have wanted it. My wife, she would want it right after me. That would work okay. But the bottle is half empty. The plastic's already been cracked. And we think about what we didn't get. Did you follow that? Our focus goes on, if you wanted to say it, the glass is half empty. It's not full. It's already had somebody's goopers on it. It's bad. But God is generous, but we get our heads tweaked because we keep thinking the wrong thing. So here's the question of the morning. Do you have trust issues? And that's the way. Last week I said, the greatest thing we can know is that God is trustworthy. The greatest thing we can do is trust God. Do you have, do I have trust issues? Do you have needs? Are you needy today? I hope you are. Because if you're aware that you're needy, then you're a great one to recognize God's generosity and to receive it into your life. Does that make sense? So do you have trust issues? Then here is the answer. Look at God's generosity. Look at God's generosity. See, God is good all the time. And God is trustworthy. And the way I can know God is trustworthy is to look at his generosity, how much he has given to us. Does that make sense? Now, here's the deal. How many here have a financial bank account? How, how many? Uh, can I see your hand? How many have a bank account in the bank? Finance, you got some money in it. It's, uh, it, or is it in the debit side? We got you covered. How many have a financial bank account? How many know that the idea is you got to put more in the bank than you take out? You want to put in, and then you know that there's some there with some left over. Follow? Well, we have in our life with each other what, uh, I don't know who used it. The, originally, the metaphor is an emotional bank account. And an emotional bank account is where I've put deposits into a relationship with somebody else, and my deposits are greater than my withdrawals from that relationship. Make sense? If my deposits into the relationship are greater than my withdrawals, it's called trust. It's called safety. If I have a close friendship with somebody, it's because... I've continued and they've continued and we've put deposits in each other's emotional bank account. We trust each other. We feel safe with each other. But if I'm overdrawn, 
at the bank, if I'm overdrawn in the relationship, I don't trust, I don't feel safe. Now let me just turn it around for you and say, God is continually putting deposits in your emotional bank account because of his generosity. You just don't see it. So you got trust issues because you don't know, you didn't realize God's been there all along. God's goodness has been revealed in your life all along. How many here are um, over 60? That leaves me out. How many here are over 60? How did you get here? Because you worked really hard and you earned it and you got here. Because, man, I did it. I did it. The only way you got here, trust me, I know some of you, it's only by the mercies of God. In fact, uh, Aunt Millie, I saw Aunt Millie yesterday. Aunt Millie is in San Jose, part of the church there, and, and, and uh, she's 92. It's my father-in-law's oldest sister. She's 92. So I saw her right after the wedding, and, and uh, she goes, uh, I'm 92, and she can't hear. So she speaks up really loud, and uh, I almost died three times before I was 12. She told me that, and... Uh, then I, I pointed out, I said, isn't it God is good? Because her kids were there, and then she has, she told me, I got so many kids, I got so many grandkids, I got so many great-grandkids. So about 10 minutes passed, and I saw Aunt Millie down by the hors d'oeuvres sitting there. And she said, when she saw me again, she said, I'm 92! <laughs> and I almost died three times before I was 12. But God is good, and I have all these children and children's children. God is good. And so we can trust him because he's generous. Some of you are struggling because you feel keenly the need in your own life. And what do you do with that? The only one you can truly put your weight on, trust, is God. He's generous. Now, let me just quickly give you a few questions and, and answers and that kind of thing, just to give you, why is God so generous? Well, number one reason God's so generous is because he's rich. Uh, as, as Zoe read Psalm 145, I was also thinking about last week, as Zoe read about, you know, God is trustworthy. The character, the qualities. God's got everything. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I wish he would sell some and give a few to me. God's got it all. He's rich. And Paul said, my God will supply some of your needs according to his scarcity, uh, according to his riches in Christ Jesus. He's rich. So we go, well, that works good. Why don't you share a little bit with us, Lord? And that's what he does. He's generous like a father with his children. The second reason God is generous is because he's compassionate. It's because he cares about you. He cares about you. Everybody in this room wants to know, does somebody care about me? And God brought us all together this morning so that we could just encourage and remind each other, God cares about every one of you in this room. He has compassion. He's like a father. He cares. And by the way, he's not stingy. He's generous. God is generous. So how is his generosity revealed? Well, uh, his generosity is revealed daily in little things. We just don't see it. And as I said last week, how, how is his generosity revealed? Count your blessings. Anna, did you drink that water? <laughs> well, can I have it back then? Okay. She laughed. I said, did you drink the water? She laughed at me and said, no. How come you didn't drink the water? God bless you, Anna. I wouldn't have drank it either. <laughs> My point is a simple one. We focus on what we don't have instead of what we already have. We focus on the shortfall. We focus on the wrong things, but God has been generous. So it goes like this. 
recognize, in other words, how do we know God is generous? Just look at your daily life. How many here are glad to be breathing? How many are glad to have a heartbeat? It's going. Ba -boom, ba -boom, ba -boom. Some of you are going. Ba -boom, ba -boom, ba -boom. Some of you are going. Ba -boom. Ba -boom. Where'd you get that heartbeat? Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Or as, was it, one of my elders this week said, name them ton by ton. Name your blessings. What blessings do you have in your life today? That reveals God's generosity. Here's the second way we see God's generosity revealed. It's through the special times of deliverance. It's uh, how many here have ever asked God to work in a specific situation in your life, in your family's life, among your friends? You've prayed, oh God, help. We need money for this. We need a job here. I need healing in my body. How many here have ever asked specifically of God to do something in your life and you know he's answered? Hold it, hold it. Hey, keep going, keep going. Don't make it up now. You don't have to make it up. Don't join. Oh, I'm joining the crowd here. <laughs> if you can't think of what it is, don't raise your hand. Specifically, God has shown himself strong on your behalf because he's generous. And the third way we see the generosity of God is look at the Son, Jesus Christ. God gave his own Son because in my bankruptcy, he wanted to help me. I am bankrupt apart from the, the kindness and generosity of Jesus Christ. I am bankrupt. Isn't that true? How many like the songs we sing on Sunday mornings? How many believe the words you're singing? You are good. You are good. When there's nothing good in me. That's what we sang earlier. You are good. You are good. When there's nothing good. Well, I'm not sure there's nothing. Left to myself, I'm running into the ditch. It's bad news. But God is good. And the, the demonstration of his goodness, which we miss, and it's the focus of this morning, is that God sent his only son. He loved you and me so much, he sent his only son. And you talk about deposits in the emotional bank account. Many of you this morning, you will sit and think, nobody understands who you are and nobody understands what you're going through. You think, and, and we all come along and go, oh, I can understand. And, and it almost makes you mad sometimes. You don't understand, right? Well, I'm telling you, there's one who understands. Because no matter what you've gone through, he's gone through it at a greater price than you. And his name is Jesus. He understands because He's been tested and tempted and tried in every manner. He came to identify with us. It's Jesus, who he is, what he's done for us, how he's helping us today, what he's got for us in the future. And so the generosity of God's revealed to his son, Jesus. So that's kind of the background. How are we doing so far? So here's the, here's the take home. I kept thinking, okay, God is generous. What's the point? Thank you, God. Keep it coming. Our lives work off of the stories, the narrative we give of our lives. Whatever your background, whatever your family experience, whatever your religious experience, whatever cultural experience you've had, you've created a narrative that weaves it all together. We think in stories. I noticed this week I was dreaming. How many remember having any dreams this week as you slept? Can, you don't have to remember what the dream was. I wake up the next day, what was that? I, I can remember it faintly what it is. Something, I, I, don't, I know there was a bad one there in there somewhere. But you can remember, how many can remember dreaming this week? Did you dream in points like my, quest, my, my outline or did you dream in stories? I, I dreamed and some of you were in the dream. I'm not telling you who. And I thought that was weird. But whenever I dream, it's always a story. 
Whenever you think about your life, it's always a story. We call it a narrative. And you take all the individual stories and you weave them together and try to make sense out of it. And out of that, you get an idea, a picture of what life ought to be. And that's how you also view God. So what is our, what is our wrong thinking? What is our false narrative about God's generosity? Our culture teaches us, our families teach us, our religion teaches us that we earn favor from God. It is not because it has anything to do with a particular religion. It's just our wiring as human beings. It's called the performance plan. If you perform well in the classroom, what do you get? If you don't perform, and who's determining the standard? If you don't perform at a certain level, you don't get a... And then you take that grade home and you show it to your parents. And then they go, look, you did so good and all the... What happened there? Are you following me? Or uh, how many... I, I taught a class before this hour and I, they were helping me. How many here believe that if you are good for God, God is good to you? How many think that way? How many think that if you are bad, God is bad to you? Now, some of you have been around me long enough. You go, I'm not biting on this one. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Were there times when you were growing up, those of you in your family, where if you were good, mom and dad were good to you, and if you were bad, mom and dad were bad to you? You're going to behave that way? Go to your room right now. You used for three months. You're not eating again for three months. Boy, were they ticked. They were mad, and, and uh, they were bad, and I was bad. So let me just tell you, uh, we don't earn God's generosity. That's what we just read in Psalm 145. No matter what, uh, God is not an unpleasable parent. God is not the cosmic cop just waiting for us to mess up. S some of you messed up this week. You are real sinners. And it's about time you got here. Because if you don't straighten up, we used to, when I was going to college in Springfield, Missouri, there was uh, several colleges, but I went, to the, I went to the spiritual college. It was the Bible college, Central Bible College. And then in our denomination, we had another, a liberal arts college called Evangel College. And then we would tease uh, with uh, Matt. We would go, um, you know where you go for lying, don't you? You go to Evangel. Uh, because they're the bad people, we're the good people. You know where you go for lying, don't you? If you've been messing up, you know, you could go to hell for that. Well, there's some truth to that, but it's a half-truth. Are you following me? Because if God's generosity is dependent upon your performance or your perfection, how many here have fallen short? How many here have messed up? So... We trust in God's generosity. Now, does that mean, wait, in weeks to come, we're going to cover God is holy. So don't miss that one, because I'll really stick it to you then. You bad people. Turn or burn. Is there ever a time when God's looking at you that way? Is there? How many here have ever had somebody get angry at you? How many have ever gotten angry with somebody else? How many here are not breathing? <laughs> and we tend to think like we think. Oh, this got me. Oh, I'm going to. And I've done that a few times. The righteous are bold as a lion, and I'm right, so I'm in your face. You better change. But that doesn't draw out any change in me. So it is a false. It's a myth that if you are good, then God is good to you. If you are bad, then God is bad to you. That is not true. Everybody say, not true. How many believe that? How many kind of have a little doubt about that? 
Psalm 103 verse 10 says, uh, God doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. He doesn't treat us as we deserve. He gives mercy and he gives grace and that's his generosity. That makes sense? Okay, so let's bring it home. I forgot my watch this morning, so you're really in trouble. And uh, Pastor Ryan Bell gave me his watch, but I couldn't lift my hand from the side when I had his watch on. I was going like this. It's like four times the size of my watch and like a brick. I got like this. And I, then it had four faces on it. Anyway, I couldn't figure out which time zone I was in. So, but there is a clock back there, so I got it nailed down. So what is Jesus? If we want to know what God's generosity is all about, who do we look to to, to tell us? Everything gets interpreted through the light of Jesus. What Jesus says about God is what God's like. So what is the Jesus narrative about God? We live in the favor of God. We live in the favor of God. We don't earn God's favor. We just live in his favor. We live in his favor. Okay. How many here have been on the performance plan, and you, you know what that means? You've you got to perform to get the A, or you've got to perform to get the meal, or you've got to perform to get things if you really want to be blessed. Our culture is so competitive that you, you miss out on the glory unless you are the Super Bowl champions. You know, if you just fall short, nobody remembers second. Nope, you don't remember second. It's always, and uh, how many here have brothers and sisters? In your family, was there ever a comparison going on among the brothers and sisters? Now, usually it wasn't so much in my house. It wasn't mom and dad doing the comparisons. It was my two older sisters always comparing with each other. Mom always liked you best. You know, I, I never picked up on that because I was just the little caboose that came along later. Never got that. I personally thought I was the favorite, but that's another story. But we tend to compare ourselves, and that's why it falls into this comparison mode. Anybody else thirsty? Is that Justin? Oh, come on, Justin. You can have my water. Hurry. Hurry, hurry, hurry. You got to take my generosity while you can. He's thirsty. And uh, this is Justin. And there it is. I'm sorry it's been opened. He's playing into it just perfectly because we look at life and we say the bottle is half empty. Where are you, God? And we don't really know how generous he's been. And we don't live in that sense of his generosity. Does that make sense? So, in order to get this in our thinking, we got to think like Jesus and I'll read to you a parable that's uh, too long to print out. But if you have a Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. If you have your iPad and UVerse and MTV, whatever you got on your, whatever you got, everybody's checking Zoe was talking about UVerse earlier and using your smartphones, and I'm thinking they're not checking the outline. They're looking for the scores or the news or whatever. Jesus is talking. Here's what he says about the kingdom of heaven. For the kingdom of heaven, chapter 20 of Matthew, is like the landowner who went out early. The kingdom of heaven is like the landowner who went out early one morning to hire workers for his vineyard, and he agreed to pay the normal daily wage and sent them out to work. In other words, they'd had an agreement. Here's the expectation. They're starting at 6 in the morning. They're going till dark. Here's, it's going to be a daily wage. At 9 o'clock in the morning, the landowner went out and hired through the marketplace, saw people standing around doing nothing. So he hired them, telling them he would pay them whatever was right at the end of the day. And so they went to work in the vineyard. At noon and again at 3 o'clock, he did the same. At 5 o'clock that afternoon, he was in town again and saw some more people standing around. He asked them, why haven't you been working today? They replied, because no one hired us. The landowner told him, go out and join the others in my vineyard. 
That evening, he told the foreman to call the workers in and to pay them, beginning with the last workers first. When those who were hired at 5 o'clock were paid, each received a full day's wages. I like that. You know, I just heard uh, one from a class. There was a gentleman in his 80s and just passed away. But the month before he died, he invited Jesus into his life and saw the generosity of God toward him. Do you think he got... what he was due, or do you think he got generosity and grace and mercy? A lifetime saying, I'm not, I'm not giving thanks to God for it, but in the last month, he called upon the Lord, and, and Jesus came into his life, and uh, it, it was transformational. I love that old ring. And uh, now the person that is ringing, they go, I don't want to answer it because everybody will know it's my phone. It's my phone. Just said, oh, there it is. Yeah, it's somebody that's not, that's, I won't say who that was. Okay. When those hired at 5 o'clock were paid, each received a full day's wage. When those hired first came to get their pay, they assumed they would receive more. But they, too, were paid a day's wage. They assumed they would receive more. When, the, when they received their pay, they protested to the owner. Those people worked only one hour, and yet you paid them just as much as you paid us who worked all day in the scorching heat. And the landowner answered one of them, Friend, I haven't been unfair. Didn't you agree to work all day for the usual wage? Take your money and go. I wanted to pay this last worker the same as you. Is it against the law for me to do what I want with my money? Should you be jealous because I am kind to others? Should you be jealous because I'm generous to others? Now, where we break down in knowing the generosity of God is when I compare what generosity I think God's given me with what generosity he's given you. As soon as you start comparing, then you start complaining, and then you think the bottle has been broken open and I'm not going to drink from that. And God has been gracious and generous with every one of us. In other words, no matter what your economic situation, no matter what your relational situation, no matter what your thinking, God is abundantly generous with you. He, he has abundance and he wants, and he is sharing it with you. But you and I, in our human nature, we have the scarcity mentality. I need the water. I'm not sharing with nobody. But God gives freely, we accept it freely, and then we can share it freely. We give, because God gave to us what? Which brings me full circle. You surely don't think much of God's wonderful goodness or of his patience and willingness to put up with you. How many here would say God's been putting up with you? I see those hands. How are you all doing today? How are you all doing today? I believe the answer is better than I deserve. Read Psalm 103. It says he's not giving us what we deserve. He goes way beyond what we deserve. God is generous. You surely don't think much of God's wonderful goodness or of his patience and willingness to put up with you. Perhaps you do not understand that God is good to you, so you will change your hearts and live. God is good to you. He's not mean to you to get you to change your ways. He's good to you, so that you will change the way you think and you will live for him. So, if God's doing all the giving, it's uh, one person said it's the big shovel principle. God's shovel is much bigger than my shovel. I can never outdo it. God's continuing to be generous in my life. Yours too? So what does God want from me? If God is generous, he's got everything he needs, he's great, he's incredible, and I'm sitting here, what's he want from me? You know what he wants? Now remember... 
God showed us his generosity, he gave to us first. God didn't wait for me while I was yet running from God, while I was yet pushing against God. It says Christ died for me. God's generosity came first, and because he's generous to me, then I can respond back. And that means the most important thing you can know is that God is trustworthy. And the most important thing you can do is to trust him. Or if I put it another way, the most important thing you can know is that God loves you. And the most important thing you can do is to love him back. You don't have anything to bring to the table except what he's already given you. So here's my answer. Be happy living in the kingdom of the Son. Those who complain reveal that they're not really thankful. And how many here sometimes complain? The bottle's already been opened of water. I can't drink that. May have given it to the dogs already. But to recognize that I don't have anything to bring except to be happy living in the kingdom of the Son. That I say, hey, what a life. Isn't this something? How God's working in my life. Isn't it great to be alive and Jesus is my Lord and let's go. Not out of coercion or force, but be happy. Because God loves us. He made us. How many think God is a happy God? God is the most joy-filled being that has ever, 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 ever. God is filled with joy and happiness. How many think that when God looks at you, he's happy? How many aren't sure? How many think sometimes he looks at me and he ain't happy? I suggest that God is so happy that you are his creation. He's happy. Now, is he happy with my messing up? No, he's not happy with that. And he's going to help me. He'll help me with that. He's not giving me, but he's saying, come on. Enter in to the happiness of my kingdom. Be thankful. Count your blessings. Be happy. It is a matter of trust. It's a matter of recognizing how generous he's been. Is the bottle half empty or is it half full? Is the, do we have provision? Has God been generous to us? Love. In fact, in 1 John 4, I think you have it on your notes, it says God loved us first so that we could love him back. And then if he's loved us like that, shouldn't we love one another? So we're happy to live in his kingdom today. And God brought you here just to let you know that he's good, he's trustworthy, he's generous, and he revealed it through his son Jesus. Would you stand with me this morning? I'm grateful for everybody that's here. Turn to the person next to you, and would you just say to them, sincerely as you can muster, depends on our, our maturity level, just turn to them and say, uh, man, I am so grateful you're here. I believe God exists. I believe God is good and trustworthy and generous. And I believe that is all revealed through the person of Jesus Christ. And I believe then your choice is to believe in the generosity of God that has been revealed through his son Jesus. Are you needy today? Some of you need to enter into the 
kingdom of heaven entering into a relationship with God through his son Jesus. You need to acknowledge that Jesus has given himself, he's revealed the Father, he suffered, he died, he rose again, so that you could experience true life. That's your need. Some of you are needy because you need money. You need work. You need a different job. You need another job. You didn't get that job. Some be needy that way. Some are needy because, how many understand that from a human perspective, we're all needy, right? But God invites us. He says, I'm the God that is full of grace. I'm, I want to share and give to you grace and glory, it said in, in Psalm 84:11. What does that mean? That means that God wants to give to you like an overflow of how, how much you matter. You care, you, he cares for you. Um, Everything I have has been by the grace of God, him giving gifts to me, him giving me his glory. It's all because of God. And I just bring my life to him. So this need comes up, I go, oh, God. And my Father God is the only one that has the true provision. He's the only one that has truly generosity. So if you, uh, I invite you, to accept the generosity of God today. And we do it, I'm going to ask you to do it this way, that uh, I'm going to pray a simple prayer. And then um, my first invitation goes this way. For everyone in this room that does not know the generosity of Jesus Christ, his forgiveness of your sins, his sense of a clear conscience, the sense that you have a purpose in life, the sense that you have a relationship you've never had before, a sense of accepting God through Jesus Christ, the God who loves you. And that's, that's step one. That's number one. And you just say, I want to put my full trust in Jesus Christ. I don't understand what all that, but it's why these other people are here, and they've been dragging me here for a few weeks, or I've been hanging out here for a few weeks. But it's your time. This is your morning. The greatest need is for you to know the love of Jesus Christ and the grace of Jesus Christ and the, the uh, provision of Jesus in your life. So as soon as I say the amen, I want to invite you to just step up because we, we, we want to pray with you and say we receive life in Jesus. It's a relationship with him. Does that make sense? Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for your goodness Thank you that you are trustworthy, and thank you that you reveal your trustworthiness by your generosity. And that was revealed distinctly. Your love demonstrated for us in that while we were yet away from you, rejecting your generosity, Christ died for us. This is true love, not that we loved you, but that you loved us. I believe you, God, are spirit, and by your Holy Spirit, draw people to you. People in this room that at the core of their being, they need a source of security, a place of acceptance, a relationship that's abiding and fulfilling. Only Jesus can provide that. So Holy Spirit, draw everyone in this room this morning that the starting point of their recognizing being happy is in a relationship with the eternal one that we've been singing about and talking about all morning with God the Father through his son Jesus Christ. May they have the boldness, the courage, to choose life this day and to step out and call upon the God who is generous through Jesus Christ.